OG Bros, and today we're going to be talking about section 39 of Belonging Again. We have been talking about character, hunter, the death of character, CCE, community character, ethics, EAF, the ethics against forbidding, and how these things fit together for us to deal with our sociological problems today. Where there are no givens, there can be values, but not CCE distinctly or clearly, which for Dr. Hunter means there can only be a reduction of moral exoration into a peddling of sterile abstractions, weary platita- platitudes, and empty maxims. Hunter wrote, We say we want a renewal of character in our day, but we don't really know what we ask for. To have a renewal of character is to have a renewal of creedal order that constitutes limits, binds, obligates, and compels. This price is too high for us to pay. We want character, but without conviction. We want strong morality, but without the emotional burden of guilt or shame. We want virtue, but without particular moral justifications that inevitably offend. We want good without having to name evil. We want decency without the authority to insist upon it. We want moral community without any limitations to personal freedom. In short, we want what we cannot possibly have on the terms that we want it. In this way, EAF can destroy CCE. I think Hunter would find the phrase CCE of EAF, the community, character, and ethics of the ethics against forbidding, a contradiction. Whatever CCE that might be identified in EAF, it is so weak and insignificant that to call it CCE is erroneous and confusing. The only given in EAF is it's forbidden to forbid, which in being a paradoxical given is too weak to save the CCE from being anything more than a collection of values. On this point, I'll let readers decide. As we've already discussed, Hunter discussed how pluralism and social mobility undermine the plausibility and coherence of personal beliefs and the capacity to provide a stable sense of meaning. How character was replaced by an alternative vision of the self captured by the word personality. How efforts to be inclusive undermine the necessary grounding, particularity, and situatedness of CCE. It is, you know, in quotes, it is the coherent circumstance of parentheses. It is the concrete circumstances situating moral understanding that finally animate character and make it resilient. Alluding to Charles Taylor, how we lack today sources that can support our far-reaching moral commitments to benevolence and justice. About how CCE is at least as much a function of the social order as it is a manifestation of the individual person and much more. The book is indeed rich. Hunter pointed out that character implies the moral autonomy of the individual in his or her capacity to freely make ethical decisions, and what and yet what is ethical is determined by the larger society, received by the individual, internalized into subjective consciousness, and thus experienced as the basic order order categories of life. To say individuals have autonomy to be moral isn't to say individuals have the autonomy to decide what is moral. Rather, Aristotelian, it is to say character is the, a- the act of fitting one's particular life within a community's schema. Character is found through the slow reception of God terms deep within us. God terms, as Philip Reeve put it, that exist as a presiding presence. As such, character is shaped not by a, a cowering assent to rules imposed externally, but as conscious directed obedience to truths authoritatively, authoritatively received and affirmed. In this way, the imperatives of social life possess a moral power that we recognize as transcending ourselves. Like James K. Smith argued in You Are What You Love, Hunter noted, a person's habits define their character, and thinking in terms of Smith's thought, the larger society is from what individuals receive their loves, and hence from what they receive their character, which is the internalization of a nomus as the very structure of a worldview, the organizing categories of identity and all its fluidity and complexity. For character to be character, it must be embedded in the taken for granted structures of everyday experience and internalized into consciousness. It is only when the moral life is internalized that it makes sense at all. Hunter warned that concerns for character development have largely disappeared in favor of developing the child's happiness and self-regard, and Hunter noted that though everyone always wants moral education, whatever consensus that is achieved is soon attacked, and legitimately, and legitimately as narrow secretarian, not inclusive. Sounding like Berger or Reef on how people today turn inward lacking givens, Hunter observed that the content of moral instruction has changed from objective, objective moral truths of divine scripture and the laws of nature to the conventions of a democratic society to the subjective values of the individual person. In this decontextualizing context, EAF has arisen, the therapeutic has triumphed, and Hunter noted this context only feels inclusive to those who share its assumptions and moral horizons, and perhaps those Nietzschean children who see new horizons as an opportunity for becoming and creation. Hunter lamented that people today urgently desire the cultivation of moral qualities, but under conditions we insist upon that finally render those questions unobtainable. 
um, those qualities unattainable. For Hunter, EAF can provide us values and appearance of CCE, but nothing more. Ours is a society no longer capable of generating creeds in the god terms that make those creeds sacred. Character outside of a lived community, the entanglement of complex social relationships and their shared story is impossible. For Hunter, the decontextualized self is reduced to little more than will. Sounding similar to David Hume, according to Donald, um, to Dr. Livingston, Hunter wrote, When moral rules themselves are abstracted from the normative traditions that give them substance and the social context that makes them concrete, values become little more than sentiments, moral judgments, expressions of individual preferences. Hunter explained in his book the idea of habitus and its indivisibility from particular communities, a term that, try, uh, that tries, in my mind, to combine the term givens, which we've used throughout this paper, and habits into one. Habitus refers to the taken-for-granted assumptions that prevail in a particular society. They are the habits, modes of thinking, and ways of life incubated by givens, and overall habitus is far more important than a single moral lesson. In the, mo in the most basic level of experience, habitus operates as a system of dispositions, tendencies, and inclinations that organize our actions and defines our way of being. For Hunt Hunter, meaningful character is impossible without habitus. He wrote, habitus is needed to translate character into design, and both are impossible without particular community. Hunter acknowledged that culture always changes, yet the habitus that makes it comprehensible, consistent, and compelling has steadily dissipated contributing to the psychological and existential anxiety that's so concerned Reef and Berger. Habitus is indeed wearing thin. Where a consensus remains in our moral culture, it does so only in terms of the shallowest of platitudes, platitudes which have lost the quality of sacredness, their commanding character, and thus the power to inspire and to shame. When it comes to the good without habitus, on what grounds do we come to care about it? Implicit in the word character is a story, and without particular community, people lack story that they are part of without thinking about it. Without givens, any story we are part of is a story which we know we are in. It is a meta narrative, like Perdelio's Six Characters in Search of an Author, and it's existentially destabilizing. It could be said that the restlessness of our world today is a result of us being characters who know we are in a story, and furthermore, we are characters who are looking for a story in which we can forget again that we are characters in a story, an unconsciousness which Hunter suggests requires givens and habitus. Can we unknow what we know? Hunter's work suggests character is gone for good. We want the flower of moral seriousness to blossom, but we have pulled the plant up by its roots in the name of justice and inclusivity and other things that only an immoral person wouldn't support. Today, the advocacy of virtues or consensual values has become little more than a mechanism for the assertion of personal preferences. Their validity depends upon little more than the sentiments of individuals who, by choice, accept them. It is possible to know who is it possible to know who we are without character. Characters are those in stories. How can we be in a story without character? And if we're not part of a story, how can we have identity? If we're not in a story, it might be impossible for us to, to rest. But the only way to establish a story is to establish and protect givens and reinforcing communities which necessarily risk exclusion and requiring exclusive moral orders. Under EAF, to be in a story may require making a tragic trade-off that will seem too high and an injustice to pay. This being the case, and if Hunter's work is correct that character is impossible today, then character cannot be what brings us today rest. If it is necessary for belonging again, then the time when we could belong is finished. However, perhaps this is only character as traditionally understood. The possibility of an absolute knower, Deleuzian individual, and Nietzschean child might still be with us. As noted, character is possible where there is a habitus, givens plus habits, which places us in a communal story versus an existentially destabilizing meta narrative. It could be said that the restlessness of our world today is a result of us being people who are trying to be characters in a story, but who also know that stories are just stories, and thus we struggle to fully come into character. We are people looking for a story in which we can become thoughtless about being in a story, and hence become characters. But after the fall of Givens, we'd have to be master method actors to accomplish this task. Perhaps an absolute knower, child, or delusion is someone who can leap into a story character and fully become the story character, forgetting in this very leap that the story character was created and not realized. Out of deepest reality, in Nietzsche, we could say that we must write our own story and then become method actors who literally become that story, treating it just as real as the world into which we found ourselves born, which suggests a movement between determinate and necessity, um, as discussed in The Absolute Choice on Hegel. 
Even more difficult, we could jump in and out of the story at will, changing plot directions here and there, submitting the story to revisions, and then suddenly leap back into it, into it fully as a character, never doubting the reality and authority of the story, even when it costs us, which is the most important test. As strange as this description is, there might be no other way to restore character story, which suggests the importance of studying the phenomenology of the artist, even if we could gain this rare ability. But even if we could gain this rare ability, how could we maintain community? Won't everyone atomize into their own story character? Is that only avoidable if there is a transcendent god unifying all the differences beyond contingency? Hard to say. For more by O.G. Rose, please see ogrose.com for the complete playlist on belonging. Again, visit YouTube, and there is a list of the sections on Medium. And thank you so much for your time.